over here. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming. Um, so, as Catherine said, I'm a nurse practitioner. Um, I'm a care coordinator, so I support people who have primary brain tumours. Um, as Catherine said, there weren't many of us around a few years ago. Um, due to different funding things lately, there's uh, quite a few of us now. I'd say there's about six uh, care coordinators in different hospitals. Some hospitals still don't have them. Um, so, but, you know, in my view, any sort of support, whether it's from a social worker, OT, allied health, any sort of thing that's going to help you through the pathway um, is a benefit than nothing at all. Um, so that's my plug for care coordinators. Today I'm going to talk about, uh, and I have to keep remembering this of what I'm actually talking about because I do go off on tangents, so I'm going to talk about symptoms to expect um, with brain cancer. So uh, a presentation um, with somebody with a lesion in their brain is generally quick, but it can be something that changes over months. And it may be family or relatives or other people around you who actually notice things. And that's more so around the changes in regard to personality, memory changes, the confusion sort of part of it, where the family members are noticing things more than the actual patient is. Um, and changes in uh, gait or limb weakness that can change over time where people are sort of just dragging a foot rather than a whole limb becoming paralysed. So things can change slowly, but generally with high-grade brain tumours it tends to be pretty quick where you present with a sudden uh, onset of headaches or a persisting headache that's just not going away you know, even with lots of Panadol and, and Nurofen, as I've seen over the years, increased drowsiness. So when you've got a lot of pressure in your brain, um, all you want to do is go to sleep, falling asleep mid-conversation, not getting up. Nausea, vomiting. Um, so when it gets to that sort of crucial point where you've got a lot of pressure within your brain, um, you're going to vomit and vomit and vomit. Seizures, so sudden... Um, presentation with a seizure out of the blue. As I said, any changes to mo mobility, gait disturbance, limb weakness, changes in balance, speech changes where you're getting the wrong words out. Um, and a lot of the time in your brain, you know what you want to say, you just can't get those words out. Um, the personality, memory changes, confusion, I have to say that's probably more so in the lower grade and you know, not always though, um, because of the frontal lobes. And any changes in vision, double vision, loss of peripheral vision, I tend to see a lot of the time where people have got no, none of the top symptoms, but they're going to their um, eye specialist to go and get a new pair of glasses and then all of a sudden they're sent into emergency to, because, you know, potentially they've got a brain tumour. And any new and unresolving urinary incontinence. So the symptoms of, of, of a brain tumour will vary a lot and it depends on where the tumour is in your brain. Um, the rate of growth, how quickly it's growing, I think with a high-grade glioma like a GBM, you know, we're not really sure how long they've been there, but it's probably only a matter of a 9, 12-week mark. So they're pretty aggressive, pretty fast-growing. Um, and also depends on the size of the brain tumour. So where it is, the size of it, and how quickly it's growing. And your brain compensates amazingly. When I think about some of the imaging that we see and how people are walking around with things in their brain, your brain is an, it's an amazing thing that compensates. Now, this was just looking at the location. This is just to do with the high-grade glioblastomas. Um, the IDH, which I think they've spoken to a lot about today, the IDH wild type or negative, they're in that subcortical white matter and the deep grey matter. Um, but looking at the lobes of the brain where they primarily are, so about a third are in that temporal part of the brain, it's probably good for you to know which part of the brain that your tumour's in because it will make you understand some of the symptoms that, you know, you have. Um, the parietal and frontal lobes about a quarter and the occipital lobes at the back of the brain where the vision is is about 16%. The IDH mutant or positive um, are 
predominantly frontal, as are a lot of the lower grade tumours, they're predominantly frontal lobe. So the reason that we're talking about um, different, um, you know, changes or symptoms within brain tumours, and it's around where your tumour actually is. So there's not sort of one main thing that will give you a symptom of a brain tumour. It really depends on the location and how much swelling it's causing within the brain. So if we start right down at the bottom, that temporal lobe um, there, and that really a, can be around a speech area where you're having trouble with word finding. It's a big um, seizure area as well where people will present with seizures, um, and it can sometimes be mobility things as well. The frontal lobes is more around that high executive functioning, your intelligence, reasoning, um, personality changes in this area and urinary incontinence can come from this area if you see people that have got a lot of swelling in their frontal lobes you know they tend to have that urinary incontinence um, and then around to the parietal lobe towards the back of the brain that's around reasoning telling left from right and your comprehension of language so you can read something but you can't and you can read it out loud really, really well, but you're having trouble comprehending what's actually, you know, going on. Then the occipital lobe is primarily around vision, so you will lose complete or part vision um, in the area. I actually saw this morning on, on the news when I was coming in, they were talking about new movies that were out today. And there's a movie with a great, I thought he was French, but it turns out he's Irish, um, actor called Gabriel Byrne. And he uh, gets diagnosed with an astrocytoma in the parietal lobe. That's the clinch of the movie. And it's basically what he's going, going through. It's around that um, occipital uh, parietal lobe, but he is hallucinating a lot. So the movie is actually around the hallucinations and things he's seeing. So you can get seizures in that back part of the brain as well, and they can be a bit bizarre where you do see things. Um, I've had patients over the years that have seen broccoli float by and stuff like that. So um, different parts of the brain will do some weird and wonderful things. And then the area down, right down the bottom, the grey bit, the cerebellum, is really around your balance and coordination. So people walk around like they're drunk, but they feel like they're walking straight. Um, so depending on which lobe of the brain, you know, what challenges you end up with. So it can be very varied. But I think it's good to know, as I said, where your lesion is so that you kind of get and the family or carers understand what the changes in symptoms are and why they're occurring. So just touching a little bit on the cognitive issues in these areas, so obviously that front part of the brain is around attention, concentration, that high executive function, you know, so it can be a challenge where, and a lot of the patients I see look very, very normal, look like everybody else, but sometimes they're processing of information attention, that part of it can be a challenge. Um, the working memory and learning, learning new things more so, um, and that visual, visual uh, spatial function area at the back of the brain. So just talking a little bit more about the cognitive function. So a lot of the patients that I see tend to have problems with short-term memory function. Uh, Long-term will be very good, so bringing up stuff that happened 30 years ago and really good about that stuff, but what's happening here and now in regard to medication, appointments, timing of medications, you know, when your MRI is, you know, that sort of thing can be a bit of a challenge. Um, and again, the difficulty with comprehension and attention, so understanding what's going on and why things are happening. Um, some patients can be a little bit irrational and that can, you know, your medications that you're on can come into play with that as well, but, but will also lack insight. So where you've got somebody who's wheelchair bound but they keep asking when they can get back to driving and things like that. Um, the poor ability to plan, make decisions, um, realise imp importance of certain tasks. So you've got a carer that is saying we need to get to this appointment at 10 o'clock in the morning and the patient sort of still, or the person with the brain tumour is still languishing at home at quarter to 10 in the morning and they can't see the importance of 
certain tasks. Um, and the loss of uh, word finding or any speech issues. As well as that, again, that altered visual, spatial and construction skills, the sensory and perception uh, functioning, the language, memory, mood, thought, content, <coughs> personality behaviours, and again, that high executive functioning and intellectual functioning. So I suppose the, the, the thing with brain tumours is you've got you know, the actual brain tumour that's causing a problem within the brain, within a particular location of the brain. Um, you've got a lot of swelling potentially around that lesion as well. Um, you've got side effects or changes because of the tumour itself, because of surgery that you may have, you know, where things change. People sort of come out of surgery sometimes a bit concussed and a bit fluffy-headed for a couple of weeks and things then settle down over time. Um, but also then we go in and we treat people with chemotherapy, with radiation, and these um, <coughs> have changes on the way people feel as well. So, you know, those initial side effects of treatment, not with chemotherapy, this is more around radiation um, effect. And, you know, usually pretty minimal, but the main um, thing here with the radiation is around that increased cerebral swelling or cerebral edema that Dr Back was talking about. I find can be in the last couple of weeks of radiation or that first four, six weeks after radiation when we do that initial MRI, but it can be anywhere sort of up to eight to 12 weeks afterwards. And you could be fine when you come and see us with an MRI at that one month after radiation's complete and then things change a couple of weeks later. And it's all got to do with that swelling within the brain. Um, and then the long term, just um, touching on that, I think that fatigue is one of the biggest things that changes your cognition and comprehension and how you, you know, manage your brain tumour. Um, and this can be immediate fatigue or this long-term fatigue where you just feel quite fuzzy and you're not taking information in as quickly as you normally would. So this edema or brain swelling that we keep talking about, so as you know, your brain's in a closed box with an inbuilt helmet. Um, so if you've got something going on in there that's not really supposed to be going on in there and there's not much room for movement, some, some change is going to occur. And it can be seizures, it can be more sleepiness. This patient here, he had a uh, glioblastoma. It was a very extensive glioblastoma. They resected it, and this is his MRI a month after he completed radiation. So you can see the white changes um, on your ro uh, right, yeah, uh, is a lot of swelling in the brain. And this patient's family were ringing me um, in the couple of days leading up to this scan, and they couldn't wake him up. He was very, very sleepy. Um, and so we had to give him some dexamethasone and the dexamethasone relieved the swelling in the brain and things improved and he was actually able to come in for the scan without too many issues. So the swelling in the brain can cause some massive changes which needs really pretty quick attention. So talking now a little bit about the things that we use, medications that we use for the symptom or the effects that we've either the brain tumour is causing or the treatment that we're causing on the brain tumour. And some of the issues that these drugs can... Um, sorry, that's the work phone going. Um, some of the issues that the drugs can actually cause. So you're using something to control one part and it's ca causing something else. So dexamethasone is the only drug that we have to control that swelling in the brain. If we don't get the swelling under control, it can be a pretty dire outcome. Um, but we're desperately trying to get people off dexamethasone because it has a whole multitude of um, side effects that can you know, make your quality of life pretty bad. So the main one that we constantly go on, on about is that muscle weakening of, or wasting where you end up that you can't actually mobilise and get around because you just don't have the muscle capacity or strength to do it. That increased appetite and increased weight gain, more fat rather than muscle, can also make you retain fluid. Um, the skin fragility, so when you see people that have been left on dexamethasone for many, many, many months, 
they end up with little bruises and skin fragility and the skin can become pretty paper thin. Um, the anxieties or dexamethasone psychoses um, that can occur with high doses of steroid um, and the poor sleep where you're absolutely dog tired and really need a good night's sleep and you're awake, you know, um, an hour or two after you've had your dexamethasone. So these are some of the um, side effects of the drugs that we use, um, but that we need to use. And also the issues around diabetes or increasing your blood sugar and things like thrush and pneumocystis, herpes zoster, it brings those things on a bit um, easier as well. And then I wanted to touch on some of the drugs that we use for, to control seizures because, you know, a lot of patients, some of them aren't on anti-seizure medication, but throughout the course of your treatment or diagnosis, a lot of people are. Um, we can cause allergies to anti-seizure medications. Um, you know, some of the newer drugs aren't too bad, but things like Dilantin that was used many years ago, People would come out with a terrible rash, but newer drugs like lamotrigine can cause the same sort of things. Um, the medications can be affected by other drugs. So when you're increasing or decreasing steroids, you're changing the levels of your anti-seizure meds. Um, and managing mood. So I think more so than, um, you know, the titrating the level of the drugs now, we don't see that so much with the current medications that we've got, but a lot of the current medications that we've got can cause some pretty terrible moods in mood in people where they can get terribly depressed, angry, um, suicidal thoughts, and those things need to be managed. We, you know, I, I saw a young guy um, and he was on Kepra and he was on a small dose of 500 morning and night. He had a seizure. We increased the Kepra to 750, which still isn't a massive dose. And he was going to punch a wall in. He became that small increase of that medication just made things quite, you know, angry and agitated for him. So when you're a carer, you're a family at home, it's pretty hard to manage those sorts of things. And then some patients are on uh, multiple anti-seizure agent, agents to control their seizures, sometimes up to four medications. Um, and that can make you feel pretty fuzzy and pretty numb in the brain. And people will say that, you know, their thinking and clarity just isn't as sharp because of the medications. But it's a bit, bit of a catch-22 because you need the drugs to control the problem. So what can be done? because there's a lot of negative stuff there. I suppose a lot of it is um, getting support from your care coordinator <laughs> to help you manage some of these things, which then leads to early intervention to medical staff. I think as a care coordinator, I probably advocate a hell of a lot for the patients that I see and the carers that will ring up, you know, and I'll harp on to the doctors that maybe the drugs we're using aren't the right medications. Um, but also link in to things like emotional wellbeing um, for the patient and the carers, so clinical psych, psychology, counselling, that sort of thing. When I started my job, I didn't think I'd do as much counselling. I'm not trained in counselling, but a big part of holding a phone and being accessible for people is that, uh, you know, emotional support. And, you know, I'm happy to do that as a lot of care coordinators are. But I think, you know, it's also realising that you need to refer on to the correct people as well. Um, and that goes on to that, you know, psychosocial assessment and the provision of required care. So getting to the appropriate people that are more better trained than myself to help people in that area. Um, referring to allied health, rehab, social worker, getting access with all the paperwork to the, for ACAT and NDIS. Um, rehab for us now and something that I've seen change over the years, as Dr Back was saying earlier on, you know, it was a little bit nihilistic for brain tumour patients, but it's a massive benefit. If I can get somebody into a rehab team and get them seen, the benefits for the patient cognitively and physically are a mammoth. You know, it's a really, really important thing. And I mean, I have to say, I'm in an area of Sydney where we have really, really good access. And so the access to rehab's not always so easy, but it's something that you really need to push, you know. 
Um, and as I said, the early intervention to the medical staff and educating people. Um, I, I'm a big advocate of educating people and trying to get them to understand why symptoms or changes are occurring and, you know, getting them to understand their MRIs and why things are happening. Because I think if you um, can understand why things are happening, you tend to manage them a little bit better. Um, and that comes into... Also, what Dr. Back was talking about was the care and mastery, making experts or semi-experts of the people that are the carers um, to um, enable them and encourage them to, you know, enact. That's a big part of what we do. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, what's actually out there and what's available. And this is many, many years old, Liz, 10, 11 years old, something maybe. Um, and there were a whole heap of fact, fact sheets that were put out um, through the Cancer Institute. Um, they're a bit hard to find. I, I, I think they're on the BTAA website. We put them on there. And there's a whole heap of them. This one um, was around memory and really it was around educating the patient but also <coughs> the caregivers around issues that patients with brain tumours um, face. And this was another part of the educational thing that I was talking about. So there's a whole heap of these fact sheets that are available that are just pretty useful from an education point of view. Um, of course, the Cancer Council support, they've got the telephone um, support groups, but they also have the practical and financial. I think when you... Mm, Nearly done, Liz? <laughs> <laughs> yes, she is. That's what I was just going to say. And I think... As Dr Cole is going to do rehab, um, we've also got Cancer Council after me, so it ties in nicely. Um, you know, if you're under financial stress and getting a lot of pressure from work, um, it's a massive, massive change for you when you're being diagnosed with a brain tumour. So support systems like this and, and advice. And, I, you know, they do pro bono work, so it's good to try and access these things. Of course, the support groups, that's your plug. Um, the resource that came out uh, two years ago now, was it 12 months, two years, um, with the booklet about, you know, it's okay to ask. You know, we're all time poor, but it is okay to ask and you write your questions down when you do see your health professional so that you can go through things. And the final thing, which it's not going to turn up on the slide today, was recently... Um, one of our patients, a young, she's probably 30 or 40 years of age, working as an accountant, managing a group of about 60 people, a um, couple of kids, and she got diagnosed with a brain tumour. And she um, saw an opening where she felt unsupported and she's come out with a, a bit of help from some health professionals and launched this uh, survivorship drive diary um, recently and I'm just gonna thank you she's on the front page of um, of the BTAA book her name's Cassandra Bennett um, and she's done a great great job at the we released um, or um, the book recently with because um, it's brain tumor awareness month of course everybody knows and I will get out of here because I've got another the guy might have to help me. Can you help me get out of here? I don't know where the cursor goes. I know you're telling me it's on a different thing, but I cannot see it. <laughs> Just shut that one down for me. Ah, there it is. Just close it all together. And I'll open up this one down here. So I just want to talk... Whoops, get out of there. Yeah, it's not showing. It was the um, thing that I put up. So as you can see, though, that was um, from the help of a whole heap of people. I think Cass dragged in friends of hers that were, um, you know, visual people, and they've done an absolutely brilliant job on this book. Um, and the whole idea with the book um, is talking about survivorship. And Cass said to me at the beginning when we were working on this book that she really wanted it to be given out at... Um, you know, neurosurgeons' um, surgeries, but not everybody goes through a neurosurgeon's surgery. But my other point is you can pick this book up at any time and it's going to be relevant to you. So it doesn't need to be from the beginning, 
to the end because things are ever changing. Um, and really it was around that whole survivorship and, you know, what is survivorship? And it's really around the focus on the health and wellbeing of people and their families who are living with, through and beyond cancer therapies. So that's what the whole domain of um, survivorship um, is. It's been, been a bit of a buzzword over the last few years um, because people are living longer. So you need to support them. Um, now, the brain cancer survivorship, as Cass says, starts at the diagnosis, but it goes through. But as I said, you can pick this book up at any time um, and I think you're going to get absolute value from it. Um, it was put together by um, Cass as a patient and a whole heap of um, medical people put their time into um, supporting this book and going through it. But it's really, um, as she says, a short summary of the different stages of treatment, different questions that you can ask your medical team, um, forms that you need filled in, your work, you know, your return to work, your driving, your um, accessing super you know, all these sorts of things, terminal illness claims, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and then a checklist for hospital packing, you know, what to put in your bag each time you come in as an inpatient, little things like that, different insurance details um, and calendars. So, OK. So it goes through different stages. As you can see, there's all these different stages down to number 10. But really, even if you pick the book up and you were starting chemo, you're going to have benefit from it. I don't think it's going to disadvantage you at any time. And just a little bit on how to actually get the book. So they, these are free at the moment. She will send you one of these out. Um, you can actually get it in a hard copy or a soft copy. You can download it and read it on your computer or sh they will send you one out if you just go to the www.survivorship diary.com and they will send you one out. I actually went on the website yesterday and ordered myself one to see how hard it was and it is a bit um, tricky because you go to the order your free copy, you put your details in that and then you've actually got to go back up to the little shopping basket up the top to then finalise. It's free, it, you know, it comes up through a bit of a process of paying but you actually pay nothing and then they mail you this out so if you want that that's a way of getting it um, but and I've got just this one here today if anybody wants it because I'm not taking it back to the office uh, so that's all I had to say I just wanted to um, bring up this great other resource that we've got for brain tumor patients sure <laughs>